All right, we are live. All righty. Let's say good evening to everyone. Father Tom Zephyrus uh, from the Ascension Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Oakland. And I pray that you're all having a wonderful day. We're, we have beautiful weather here in California, and we're excited. We may get some rain tonight, which is a very strange occurrence for us. So we're very blessed to have that. And, uh, you know, uh, today is the Western Western Christianity's Palm Sunday. Next Sunday is their, uh, is their Easter. Uh, we, we are a week later this year. So uh, uh, I, I will mention this again, hopefully, if I remember at the end of the, uh, of the, of the, of the Bible study that uh, we will break from uh, our evening Bible study, Palm Sunday and Pascha Sunday, Easter Sunday, and then we'll resume on May 1st. And uh, in the month of May, we'll finish up the book of acts and this evening uh, as it's uh, we posted we're on chapter 21 of the uh of the book of acts but today is a very very special day in the church as well it is uh, the feast day of saint mary of egypt now her the day that we commemorate her passing her death is april 1st that is her quote unquote official feast day but <clears throat> Over the course of the history of the church, the, uh, the church saw her life as being so significant that they have dedicated uh, the fifth Sunday of Great Lent to the memory and prayers of St. Mary of Egypt. And I just want to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about her, not so much about her, well, a little bit about her, but uh, there were two hymns that were chanted this morning during the service that precedes the Divine Liturgy, the service of Matins. And uh, the hymns are, are, like all the hymnography of the church, are, are significant and uh, poetic and deeply uh, theological and mystical. So we got all those things going on in hymnography of the church. These are prayers, of course, that have been set to music. And they are reflections on what it means to be a Christian. So uh, the quick story about St. Mary of Egypt, she lived a a very, very uh, uh, horrible life as, as a human being. Uh, she was uh, not a very good person. Um, she found herself in the Holy Land. She wanted to join Christian pilgrims to reverence the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there was some invisible force that was keeping her from kissing the cross of Christ. It is at that point that she has a moment of clarity, not so much a intellectual clarity, but a spiritual clarity. And she sees that the person that she is was not the person that God had intended her to be. What an amazing insight. Be able to see uh, who you, who God wants you to be, not who, uh, not who you are. And in that moment of clarity, in that ability to see who she should be, she repents. She venerates the icon of the Virgin Mary, and she crosses the Jordan River and goes into the wilderness, the same place where St. John the Baptist went, uh, and many uh, other um, ascetic saints of the church and she spends her entire life i think it's 47 years she spends in the wilderness and in the course of those 47 years uh, not too much is known about her it's not till there is a priest monk that probably around the 46 years she's out there he goes into the wilderness to commune any ascetics that are out there and he communes uh, mary of egypt and uh she tells him her life, and uh, he goes back the following year and uh, sees that she has passes. He buries her in an unmarked grave, and that's all we know. That's all we know about her. And she becomes this great icon of repentance, uh, this great icon of self-awareness, and this great icon, uh, an example of the ability 
to turn to God and for God to forgive. So uh, I just want to share with you uh, two hymns that were uh, that were sung this morning. As I said, um, the first hymn was chanted at the end of matins, and the second hymn was chanted at the beginning of matins and in the divine liturgy this morning. The first hymn gives us a little bit of a a, a summation of of what she did. After you had worshipped in the holy lands with rejoicing, therein also you received the salvific means for your road to excellence. And you ran earnestly the fine way of virtue. Having crossed the Jordan's river stream unhesitatingly, you began your residence in the place where John the Baptist lived before. And by your ascetic way of life, you subdued the passions, ferociousness, with confidence, O saint, and your carnal throbbings you anonymized, mother ever memorable. So what um, yeah, Robin King, I put this in the chat, uh, a four stops her. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's what I talked about. She could not reverence. She went to go into to reverence the uh, the cross of Christ, but could not. And, uh, and that's where she had this moment of clarity. After that took place is after you had worshiped in the Holy Lands, after she had her moment of repentance, after she prayed in front of the icon of Christ, of the Virgin Mary, uh, she was in the Holy Land rejoicing, rejoicing over what? Her return to God. She was not lamenting her sin. She was not looking back at the past. She was looking toward the future. You received the salvific may, means for your road to excellence. And I love this line here because the hymnographer is telling the salvific means for your road to excellence, that our salvation is this process of walking closer and closer to God. The closer we come to God, the better we're able to see ourselves, the better we're able to see ourselves, the better we're able to assess how we're living our life. And you ran earnestly, uh, you know, Paul says, uh, let us run the, I've run the good race. And he also uh, talks about in, uh, I think it's in Philippians, where he says straining, like uh, the straining to to reach the finish line, straining like an athlete. Uh, You were ran earnestly the fine way of virtue. Okay, she's straining, she's running this race to be what God wants her to be. You cross the River Jordan stream. And you began your residence in the place. It says unhesitatingly. There was no second thought. She went there. And by your ascetic way of life, you subdued the passions. You overcame those things that kept you away from God. The passions are these God-given drives that we have. And originally, they were given to us to bring us closer to God. But when we fell, these pathi, these passions, get uh, how should we say, re, uh, misdirected. And rather than using them for uh, a relationship with God, they cause us to, to follow things that are bad for ourselves, that, that these are these drives that lead us away. These same drives, when they're focused towards God, lead us to salvation. When they're focused in other directions, they lead us away from God. So she subdued those passions that led her away from God, which meant the passions that she did have the pathy mm. now are, are driving her towards Christ or bringing her closer to Christ, that Christ is drawing her to her. Uh, and, and then you subdue with ferociousness, with confidence, so say. So she was ferocious in her efforts and uh, you minimized these drives and you became, as the hymn uh, writes, mother ever memorable. The second hymn, which is also the Troparion, the Tropar, or the Apolitikion of St. Mary of Egypt, says the following. In you, O Mother, is preserved undistorted what was made in the image of God. For taking at the cross, you followed Christ by example taught that we should overlook the flesh since it passes away and instead look after the soul since it is immortal. And therefore, O devout Mary, your spirit rejoices 
with the angels. So again, uh, beautiful commentary on her and in the orthodox understanding of what we are all about as human beings. You preserved undistorted what was made in the image of God. Here's a person that lived, like I said, a very, very uh, a sinful life. But in her repentance, she was able to preserve, have God restore within her uh, what was made in the image of God. Once that happens, you are on the right path. Taking up your cross, you followed Christ. And that's what she did. In her unique way as an ascetic, she took up her cross and followed Christ. And by example, taught us that we should overlook the flesh, that we are not here on this planet simply to serve our own uh, needs, physical needs, but that we should look after what's going on inside of us as well, that we work on how we are supposed to live, how we are supposed to uh, treat one another, and how we're supposed to inter 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 interact with God. So instead, look after the soul, since it is immortal. This flesh is temporary. The soul is immortal. So St. Mary becomes this, again, this wonderful example of what it means to be a, uh, a follower of Christ. And again, not so much looking back at what she did wrong. In this uh, ascetic journey, she's looking forward to encountering Christ and knowing Christ. So this is a, this is a really, really a, a, a amazing thing. And this happened probably when she was maybe 15, 16, 17 years old, uh, 47 years. She probably died when she was 50 or 60. Um, but even though she lived such a horrible life, the repentance was real, the restoration, the forgiveness, uh, was real, and it was healing, and it brings her to this point in the history of our faith of someone that's an example of, of what God can do in our lives. So I pray that St. Mary of Egypt is with us always, uh, that she becomes this great example for us, and may her story uh, encourage all of us to repent, to, to be with God, and to uh, follow his path, to unhesitatingly enter that path of virtue, to take up our cross and follow him. So that's a little bit about St. Mary of Egypt. Um, and now we'll start our evening prayer to begin our Bible study. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Master, love mankind. Make the pure light of your divine knowledge shine in our hearts, and open the eyes of our minds to understand your gospel teachings and plant also fear of your blessed commandments so that trampling down all fleshly desires, we follow a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing all those things that are well pleasing to you. For you are the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God. And to you we send our glory with your unoriginated Father, your all holy, good, and left creating spirit, now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. So, We are now in chapter 21 of the book of Acts. And um, as we will see, uh, this is a uh, uh, nearing the close of the, uh, uh, of the book of Acts, but it's a, a particular part of, of, of this book where St. Paul returns to Jerusalem and he will be in Jerusalem for a while. And from there, he will go to Rome and the book of Acts concludes with Paul in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in under house arrest in Rome, him thinking that he's going to be released quickly, and he will be able to go on to Spain to do missionary work in Spain. So, and I just want to say good evening to Rita, Irene, and my cousin Karen. God bless you all for being with us, and everybody that's with us here on uh, 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 OCN. Um, so, we're going to begin here with uh, chapter 21 verses 1 through 6. And uh, while I'm doing that, uh, I will ask uh, Noel to set it up so I can share my screen, just so I can share a map for those people while I'm reading here. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Now it came to pass, 
that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos, the following day to Rose, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children until we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. So um, I'm going to share my screen re real quick here, just to see if I can do this. Uh, Can you see that map? Uh, I'm not seeing it, Father. Hang on a second. I needed to do something here. I need to share screen. There we go. How about now? There it is. Okay. I just, I, I do this, and I'm sorry for the people on Facebook. Uh, sorry, guys, you're not, uh, for those of you on Facebook are not going to be able to see this. Um, if, while I'm doing this, if you go uh, uh, while you're on uh, the computer and look up Paul's third missionary journey, map of Paul's third missionary journey, you will see, uh, you can call it up yourself. I, I don't know how to do this on Facebook, uh, but I know how to do it on my computer. Um, hang on a second. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to do this. So sorry about that. So uh, this is only for those people that are on the Zoom on uh, on uh, my OCN. All right. Yeah, go go to go on go on to your own server. Thanks, Rita. Go on to your own server on your server and look up the third mission, Paul's third missionary journey. If you look at Paul's third missionary journey, you will see uh, that. Uh, there is a red arrow, at least on mine, that, and if you look on the west coast of what is called Asia, there's a city called Miletus, okay? So, um, Paul leaves this city. It is kind of like the port city for the area. He had asked the people, the leadership from the churches back in chapter 21, uh, from Ephesus to come down and meet him there. And um, he closes out chapter 20 with this. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. So it is at this point that Paul gets on the ship. He wants to get back to Jerusalem for the Jewish celebration of Pentecost. And St. Luke, who's in the ship with him, now describes the journey. They go from Miletus. You will see uh, almost straight south of there, the island of Kos, C-O-S. They sail past it, uh, and from there, they go past the island of Rhodes. You will see the, the red line uh, uh, north of the city of Rhodes. He stops in the port of Patara. This is uh, uh, the, the port city of Lycia. From there, they, they sail past the west coast of Cyprus and they disembark in the city of Tyre. So when Paul, and we don't need to, uh, we can stop sharing this screen because that kind of gives you the idea. I just wanted you guys to give you an ex a, a sense. Oh, and 
before uh, I close this down, you will see the city of Tyre, Dolomes, which is just south of that, Caesarea, Maritima, Maritime Caesarea, and then the city of Jerusalem. This is the uh, what Paul will take the, the ship from Tyre to Ptolemy. They'll hike down to Caesarea. Uh, they'll take the boat down to Caesarea, and then they'll hike into Jerusalem. Okay, so that kind of gives you. This is how Paul closes out his third missionary journey. All right, so we'll stop sharing the screen. And there we are. Anyway, so Paul leaves his mission, his third missionary journey. He said goodbye to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was a really tough place for him. Uh, he was attacked there. People were upset with him there. And this is going to play out later in this chapter. And he finally makes it to the coast of what we would consider Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, that area right now. And he gets off the ship at Tyre. And in verse 4, we are told, in finding disciples, we stay there seven days. So Paul searches for Christian followers in the city of Tyre. Now, we're really not sure if there was a large uh, Christian community there or not, but there was a Christian community in Tyre. Uh, he found these people. They were happy for him to be with them. And um, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. The prophets of their congregation said it would not be good for him to go down Jerusalem. They had been inspired by God to know that, or they knew through God's grace that something was going to happen to Paul in Jerusalem. He would be in prison. He would suffer. He was urged not to go. Verse 5, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. So, I don't know, was he there a week? We really, it doesn't really say specifically, but he was there probably uh, a while. He had an impact on them. They didn't want him to leave. They were so enthralled with St. Paul. They were so impressed with St. Paul. Uh, they all accompanied us. All the followers of Christian, all Christian followers followed them with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and we prayed, just like they did when they left Miletus. They prayed with them. Those people then returned home. When we'd taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, they returned home. So Luke gives a very, very detailed description of their, of their journey from Miletus back to the, uh, the coast, uh, the uh, coast of uh, Palestine. He points out this uh, beautiful event. And St. Paul, even being warned, he still continues his journey. Verses uh, 7 through 16 now. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied, and we stayed many days. A certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, when he'd come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from the place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean weeping and breaking my heart? For I am, I not, for I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. 
So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed up and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain nonsense of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. So, again, Paul is, uh, St. Luke has taken us quickly, fairly quickly through this event because he wants to get Paul at least uh, literally uh, uh, to, uh, to Jerusalem. So, they went to Ptolemais, they greeted the brethren in Ptolemy, and then they continued on their way. They headed down the coast, and then they go on to Caesarea, which is the main port of Palestine. And they come to the house of Philip. Philip the evangelist. Philip, one of the seven deacons. Philip, who early on in the book of Acts becomes one of the first uh, evangelists to reach out to non-Jews. He has the encounter with the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, uh, and he does preach amongst the Gentiles that are there in the area where he was. And uh, they stayed with him. So, and this is from your Orthodox Study Bible, pretty much, but it's nice to hear the footnotes. This is Philip, one of the seven deacons who preached the gospel first in Samaria. Samaritans were not Jews. And then to the Ethiopian eunuch who had settled in Caesarea. So with Philip there, there's no doubt that there's going to be a fairly lively, uh, spiritually uh, uh, rich church. And... Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. We don't know what they said. Paul doesn't, I mean, St. Luke doesn't give us an example. But again, from your Orthodox uh, study Bible, interesting enough, uh, it points out that the gift of prophecy is given to both men and women. Many holy women were prophetess, prophets, including Mariam, the sister of Moses, Deborah, Hulda, Isaiah's wife, the Virgin Mary, and Anna. So this is both Old and New Testament. But so women the, the, had a, a profound role in, 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 the, in the church and in uh, salvation history. And as we stayed many days, a serpent prophet, Agabus, came down from Judea. So now we have another prophet. He comes down from Judea. He arrived after Paul and his followers had been many days in Caesarea and had stayed with, and they were lodging with Philip. And he offers a dramatic, if you will, prophecy. Now, what he does here is reminiscent of what the Old Testament prophets would do. They would do something that seemed uh, uh, fairly. Uh, let's see, again dramatic and what did he do he takes his belt he took paul's belt bound his own hands and feet and said thus says the holy spirit um, the old testament prophets would say thus says the lord so this is similar to Old Testament prophecy, uh, Agabus is speaking, if you will, with the same authority of one of the Old Testament prophets. Thus says the Holy Spirit of the Lord. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So he's telling them what Paul probably already knows. More than likely, he already knows. He knows he needs to go back to Jerusalem. He's driven to go back to Jerusalem. Now, don't forget, he has the, uh, the donations, the funds that have been collect collected to help the church there in the Holy Land. But Paul is driven. He knows, and he knows from before that something's going to happen to him there. But, but he, he's going no matter what. 
uh, in verse 12, the people urge Paul not to go. Don't go to Jerusalem. Now, when we heard these things, both we, now this is St. Luke writing, so we means Luke and those co-workers that came along with Paul and Luke, and those from that place, Caesarea, pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. In other words, you know what's going to happen to you there. The prophecy has been made. Don't throw your life away. Paul responds, he does not want them to be upset, but he has to tell them the way it is. What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? All right, they're, they're, they're causing him uh, heartache because he doesn't want to, uh, to leave from them, but he knows he has to go. For I am ready not only to be bound, to be in chains, if you will, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So he tells them flat out, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to offer my life in service of Christ. So when he would not be persuaded, this is again Luke writing. So when, he, when we could not convince him not to go, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. So they come to this understanding that the will of the Lord has to be done. It's not up to them. It's what God intends for St. Paul. St. Paul will do what God wants him to do. And St. Paul understood what he needed to do. He had to go to Jerusalem. He had to face this. And after those days, we packed up and went to Jerusalem. So they loaded their things, whatever it was, whether they had some pack animals, we don't know. But they did the, uh, I forget if it's 30, 40 mile journey, maybe 60 mile journey um, from Caesarea up, up to uh, Jerusalem. No matter whether you are north, south, east, or west, uh, Jerusalem, you're always going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem's on a high place, up in a mountain. In verse 16, we were told that some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Manasson of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. So they were going to be staying at Manasson's house, I guess, there in, in, in Jerusalem. And Manasson was an early follower. He was someone from the beginning who had followed Jesus. And he was going to be uh, the person that, uh, that they will, will, will stay with while they're in Jerusalem. Verses uh, 21, verses 17 through 26. We start seeing the issues that are going to arise as Paul returns to Jerusalem. And uh, this kind of lays it out here in this section of Acts. Again, and when we, this is St. Luke writing, so there's a, there's a group of them. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that their children are not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, 
do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which you were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So a lot of stuff happening in here that we need to clarify. Paul now has returned to Jerusalem. The people uh, are excited. He goes, sees James. James is the first bishop of Jerusalem, the leader of the church. And when, when this entourage of people, these followers of uh, or disciples, co-workers of St. Paul, go to meet with James, all the elders were present. So it's not just uh, James, but all the leaderships of the Church of Jerusalem are there with St. Paul. Paul uh, is a controversial person. And he caused great concern in Jerusalem within and without the church. The non-Christian Jews hated him. And the Christian Jews distorted, dis, uh, distrusted him. So he meets with James and all the elders. He greets them, and he tells them in detail the things, this is verse 19, which God had done, which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So Paul does not take credit for anything that has taken place in his three missionary journeys, how the church had been spread, how the gospel had been shared, how Gentiles had come to faith and received the grace of the Holy Spirit. He gives God, give, gives God the glory, if you will. In verse 20, and when they heard of it, they glorified God. They were very, very pleased. And as in, in verse 20, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they're all zealous for the law. So James is telling Paul, a lot of the Jews here in the Holy Land, and especially here in Jerusalem, have accepted Jesus Christ, but they are still zealous for the law. They were Jewish Christians who kept the law, and they were indignant, they were upset at anyone who would be against the law, and it was understood by them that Paul was against the law. Though Paul had not taught to be anti-law, but let's, verse 21, but they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. So this is what they're hearing about St. Paul that not only does he tell the Gentiles not to follow the law, he's telling the Jews that are living amongst the Gentiles uh, not, to, not to follow the, the law. He did teach that these things were no longer important or really meaningful. And Paul, Paul did teach the Gentiles that they should not submit to these externals. They were not necessary for salvation. But Paul really did not speak against the law in the sense of, if you're a Jew, another place, you know, to, to the Jew, I'm a Jew, to the Gentile, I'm a Gentile. And, and, and um, earlier on, he, he took that, uh, and we'll talk, talk about this again in a minute, this Nazarite vow 
where he, uh, before he got on the ship, he, he had made a promise to God and he followed this, uh, this uh, vow that the, the, that the Jews practiced. So the assembly, this uh, James and the, and the elders of the church, wanted to prove that Paul was not against the law. So they have a, a, uh, uh, a way of dealing with this. They have a, uh, a way out, if you will. We are told uh, in verse 23. Well, 22, they said, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. This is, okay, this, this, gra- this a gathering of elders, and James said, do what we're, we're telling you to do. Therefore, we have four men who have taken a vow. Take them, be purified with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So what's going on here? There's four of their Christian Jews that have taken this vow of cleanliness, of holiness, almost like they're consecrating themselves to God. They let their hair grow, and they would shave their heads as part of the sacrifice. And at the appropriate time, they would offer the appropriate animal sacrifices. They would offer male and female lambs, a ram, cereal, and drink offerings. And this was times four because there was four of them. This was not an inexpensive offering. You had to pay for all these things, times four. This Paul was invited to pay their expenses for this vow and for him also uh, to be purified with them. It was an act of piety when people would take these vows for other people to pay for the cost of the uh, sacrifices. This was a way for people who didn't take the vow to, if, if you will, participate and to support what they were doing. These, this, this, uh, uh, this vow was public. And the fact that Paul or someone else would pay for it, that was also public knowledge. Public notice would be given that these four men had taken the vow and that this person, in this case, St. Paul, uh, Paul of Tarsus, will pay for the, the cost of the sacrifices. In this way, the, the, uh, the leaders of the church are thinking, okay, if Paul's willing to do this, then this shows he's not against the law, that he's not an anti-Jewish Christian. And then they, and this is only, if you will, for those Christians who had been Jews for, before. They, they, they close out verse 25 by saying, concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided. We've already said what we, that they need to do. Observe, they should observe no such thing. They should not follow the laws of Judaism. They're not Jews. They should keep themselves from uh, things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. That's what was expected of them. So Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So Paul has now reached the... uh, the end of their purification. Uh, things are progressing. They probably had already made a sacrifice on the third day of this. They're now nearing the seventh day. So this is, uh, Paul is getting ready to offer the seventh day sacrifices. But problems take place. And this is where we come back to our friends from Ephesus. Uh, verse 27 through 30. 
Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place, and furthermore has brought Greeks into the temple and has de defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in, that, in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. So Jews from Asia probably were Jews from Ephesus who were already upset with Paul for all the work he had done in Ephesus. And they were very opposed to Paul. And now they had come down for, for Pentecost in Jerusalem. And they see St. Paul and they become outraged. They also had seen Paul with Trophimus, the Ephesian, as we saw down here in verse 29. They put two and two together and get 92 and said, well, Paul brought Trophimus and later they use the word plural Greeks into the inner inner tabernacle and um, and the, he has defiled this place. So they are telling Paul that they're telling people that Paul has defiled the temple by bringing a uh, pagan or, or bringing Gentiles in to where they were not allowed to be. They capture St. Paul. All the city was disturbed. People ran together, seen Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. Immediately the doors were shut. So he's in the temple. They grab him, whoever was in there, 50, 100, who knows how many people. They drag him out of the doors, and he's now in the outer courtyard, which is often, which is referred to as the courtyard of the Gentiles. So this mob drags Paul out of the temple, closing the doors to make sure that no more profanity happens in the temple, that no more non-Jews are in there. It is, uh, um, it is, the place is in an uproar. Uh, we're going to read 30 through 36. I just said 30, but we're going to read 30 through 36 to give it a little more context. And all the city was disturbed and the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were see, seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and asked who he was. And what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded to be taken into the barracks. And when he had reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after him, crying, crying out, away with him. So, um, According to your Orthodox Study Bible footnote, since Jerusalem is under Roman rule, any disturbance would be investigated by the soldiers stationed there. The commander at this time is Claudius Lysias, and he is simply doing his duty. Now, to give you a little bit of a, a picture here, they have dragged Paul out of the temple into the outer courtyard, which is called the courtyard of the Gentiles. There was a uh, tower. It was called the Tower of Antono Antonia. There where the Roman soldiers would observe what was going on. Mo many times during great festivals or set feast days of, the, of, of Judaism, there were problems. So they had soldiers there and there was a barracks. There was a stairwell that led from that tower into the court of the Gentiles. So the Roman soldiers could observe what was going on in the temple. 
they had access to the court of the Gentiles and they could go in and out that way and not, if you will, uh, defile the inner courtyard. So there was a guard that was probably seeing what was going on now in the outer courtyard. He go tells, tells his commander. The commander sees that there is a mob and a riot going on. And the commander came down and took with him uh, centurions, took soldiers and centurions. Centurions, plural. A centurion, we get the word century, was a commander of 100 soldiers. So we can pretty, uh, pretty much guess that there are at least 200 Roman soldiers down here trying to get this mob under control. And when they see the soldiers coming down the steps and coming into the courtyard, they stop beating Paul. So you can imagine they pull him, uh, people pulling him one way, people pulling him another, grab him into the outer courtyard. And now they, they, they're they beating Paul with their arms and, 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 with their, and maybe kicking him, hitting him with their hands, whatever. The commander came near, they take him and then they, they, they put uh, probably chains on each hand and then chain him to a soldier, right hand, left hand, two different soldiers. So now they've got the, quote unquote, the, uh, uh, the problem uh, under control. So now the commander's going, what's going on here? Why, you know, maybe he was a thief. Maybe he had hurt someone. What's going on here? And the people started to cry out. Some said one thing, some said another. The commander could not figure out what was going on. It's kind of reminiscent of what happened in Ephesus when Paul was taken into the theater there. And again, the Ephesians were, were there, of course. That was the Ephesian theater. So they're now working their way back to the stairwell that'll take them up to the tower and from there into the Roman barracks. He had to care, they had to carry him. So you can imagine that they're dragging Paul and they're reaching out trying to hit him. They're trying to attack him. So now they pick him up to keep him away from the crowd and they take him up the steps. And as he's being carried up the steps, they cry out, away with him. The same call that was made to Christ that we'll hear on uh, uh, away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify him, that we'll hear on, on uh, not this week, but next week on Holy, Holy Thursday. So, let's see. So again, they're taking St. Paul into the barracks because of the violence. We are now coming up with uh, 21 through... 37, I mean, 37 through 20, 39. Um, then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? So he spoke, not only did he speak Greek, he spoke fluent, very, very polished Greek. And the commander says, he replied, can you speak Greek? And he goes, are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So first of all, the commander is shocked that Paul speaks that good of Greek. And he thought that maybe this Paul was the Egyptian, this Egyptian rebel rouser who had uh, um, organized 4,000 assassins that, um, that had uh, risen up. I think they were the leader of the Sciari. And these were assassins who carried small knives and would, uh, would, would kill people. And this uh, Egyptian had taken 4,000 of these people into the wilderness. And he uh, convinced them at some time to attack the city of Jerusalem. He had told them that 
the walls would come tumbling down or and they would easily uh, overwhelm everybody. Of course, that didn't happen. And they thought that he was maybe this Egyptian. He goes, no. In fact, it was quite an insult uh, to be considered an Egyptian. He says, I'm a Jew from Tarsus, Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. Let me speak to the people. And uh, we're going to conclude there tonight uh, because this the next section is St. Paul beginning his, um, if you will, defense of what he believes. He is um, um, much like St. Stephen, going to uh, lay it on the line as to uh, what he is, what he is, uh, what he's all about. It's further on in chapter 23 that we find out that the commander of the garrison in uh, um, in Jerusalem is Claudius Lysias. A lot of things happen here in the next couple chapters. We'll pick this up after after uh, uh, Pascha. I do want to share uh, with this one thing. From chapter 21, verse 17, through chapter 26, verse 32. So we're talking about, about five chapters. St. Paul is in Jerusalem. And after that, uh, after 26, 32, uh, Paul begins in verse 27, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 27, and in uh, concluding in chapter 28, um, that's Paul going to and arriving in Rome. So this is the last phase of the book of Acts of what's going on. Uh, and this is uh, this uh, events that take place in Jerusalem. Very, very interesting. Uh, we have a new player uh, in, in the person of Felix, who has taken over as governor of Judea from Pontius Pilate. We have Herod. Uh, we have Roman soldiers. And we have this... Uh, um, if you will, this uh, uh, interplay uh, between uh, Paul and the Jewish uh, leadership. So uh, when we get together in, uh, in several weeks, uh, we will begin with Paul's defense at the temple, uh, starting with verse 40 of chapter 21 and into 22, and uh, eventually uh, what leads him to Rome. I pray that you have a blessed, blessed week uh, and a blessed uh, Sunday of Saturday of Lazarus, Palm Sunday, and Holy Week, and Pascha. We will not have Bible study on Tuesday morning. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I am uh, committed to. I have to do a funeral that day, and I and I, uh, I we just couldn't do it any other time. So again, a, a blessed Easter, uh, Pascha, Kali Anastasi, and uh, thank you for listening. Pray you have a wonderful, wonderful evening and a blessed week. Good night. Support OCN. Support OCN. They do great work.